from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York, I'm Taylor Riggs. And from Washington, D.C., I'm Kevin Cirilli. Welcome to our TV and radio audiences worldwide for Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. And, Kevin, we want to get right to the world of business here as we take a look at equity markets. I want to bring in Abigail Doolittle here. Equity markets continuing uh, to extend those gains. Abigail, bear with me. Before I get to you, I want to bring you some breaking news that we have here. China is nearing a milestone in their nuclear arms buildup. This is according to a, a Pentagon report um, that we're expecting here, their annual report on China's military capabilities, saying that China has met or surpassed U.S. in shipbuilding and other areas. The China's military still has some, quote, major shortcomings, according to this report, but they are set to double their nuclear weapons stockpile over the next decade. Kevin, here again, the big takeaway here, the Pentagon said that China is on the cusp of having a full nuclear triad. They would be then the third country after the U.S. and Russia to have some nuclear capabilities here. So really nearing that milestone in that nuclear arms build up all according to the Pentagon. I want to get some market reaction here from Abigail Doolittle. We were much higher before this report. Abigail, how are we how are we thinking? Uh, Taylor, we're right around where we were before those China headlines. The S&P 500 up about one quarter of one percent. So the risk on rally that we have seen in August, the S&P 500 in August up about seven percent. It's fifth up month in the continuing right into September and where we're really seeing it for tech stocks that Nasdaq 100 putting in another all time high at this point that Nasdaq 100 up almost 1% 9 tenths of 1% and not surprisingly Taylor and Kevin this has everything to do with Apple up once again up about 2.6% yesterday climbing after its split investors liking its post split facelift of course there was a 4 for 1 split now the stock is around $130 as opposed to $500 the value is not different but the optics may be more attractive especially to retail investors in addition Bloomberg put out an exclusive report today about the fact that the company is planning an iPhone blitz for this fall, targeting about 75 million units to be sold, similar to last year. So perhaps the pandemic not taking uh, you know, a hit there. However, interestingly, we have a small rally for bonds, but mainly a risk on tone. And where we really have strong, strong risk on uh, is Zoom video. This stock is absolutely soaring on the day. It's best day ever, uh, really up more than 40 percent. Absolutely incredible. They put up another monster quarter beating estimates in a huge way. The numbers are relatively small. We're looking at 63 cents in adjusted earnings on about six hundred and sixty three million dollars. But those revenues quadrupling from a year ago and the outlook, they raised it twice this year. Kevin, this stock up, up and away through the pandemic. And I think the big takeaway here for Zoom and some of these other stay at home stocks, this is not a fad. These trends of folks working from home and video conferencing is probably here to stay with us and folks, uh, traders and investors wanting in on that trend, Kevin. Yeah, thank you, Abigail Doolittle. I'll take it from here. And Kevin, given your perspective, you're out in D.C., this yep. annual report that we've given you at least 60 seconds to look through right now, what is your take here on nearing this milestone in China in this nuclear arms buildup? Well, three things. First and foremost, Secretary of Defense Esper tweeting out just within the last hour or so saying that China has sought to, quote unquote, double the size of their nuclear arsenal. Secondly, just within the last half hour or so, President Trump weighing in on U.S. and China relations. Specifically, he was asked by a reporter uh, at, uh, with regards to the sale of TikTok. He's doubled down on the escalating tensions on the tech front between the U.S. and China, saying that China has until September 15th in order to sell TikTok. And, and, and finally, you know, you, you look at the developments just in the Indo-Pacific as well as on the border between India and China and the, and the skirmishes, at least two in the last month, along the uh, India-China border. And all of this just bringing a heightenedness uh, to this issue. I want to bring in Bloomberg's national security team leader, Bill Ferries, for us for some more perspective. Again, just in terms of how uh, the Pentagon's report, Bill, uh, really, uh, really uh, looking, taking a look at, at China. China's military. What does it mean in terms of the potential for for where what this does to U.S.-China relations in the short term? Well, I think in the short term, it's, de it's certainly going to provide some fodder to more of the hardliners in Congress uh, and in the Trump administration who say, you know, we need to take China much more seriously. We need to cut a lot more of these technology links with them. We need to really review the entire relationship. And I think there's also an angle to this on the Pentagon side, which is 
the Pentagon is, is very interested in helping modernize and, and rebuild its nuclear stockpiles. This is going to provide them with extra ammunition to go before lawmakers after all the spending that's been done during the COVID-19 crisis and say, no, we really do need more of this funding going forward to counter China. And Bill, you mentioned in the middle of this COVID pandemic that we're in, we're getting another headline saying that the U.S. advisors are offering a draft on how to distribute a COVID vaccine. So of course, getting a vaccine and then distribution remains another big hurdle. As we're thinking about China in the middle of this pandemic, where is the international community's response? Well, I think it's uh, a very hobbled response. I mean, depending on where you look at the United Nations, uh, the Security Council there has been very divided uh, with the U.S. Uh, sometimes alone on one side against uh, China, Russia and European nations. I think, uh, you know, the U.S. pulled out of the World Health Organization earlier this year. They would normally have a very significant role in helping uh, maybe set the terms or set guidelines for how a vaccine uh, could be distributed. The big question uh, behind uh, what you're pointing out is also what if China develops that vaccine first? That will present uh, an interesting uh, difficulty for the U.S. in that case. There's more than 130 vaccines in development worldwide, only a handful of them uh, truly in phase three trials, as it's known. I want to specifically target in on two countries in particular, Bill, for how they've been dealing with China, and that's Australia and the Germans. What do we know about the contrast and how these two countries have sought to have business relationships or lack thereof with China? Well, certainly Australians have found themselves in a more difficult position. They have been pushing back against China. Uh, we have seen them come uh, join the U.S. in terms of rejecting uh, many of China's claims in the South China Sea, um, and they have paid a they have paid a price with uh, some sanctions and restrictions by China on on doing business with Australia. So that threat is very real, and it's not something that uh, just uh, Australia or Germany worries about. It's something uh, pretty much uh, every other country in the world uh, has, uh, has to deal with when they think about how closely to tow or support the U.S. position on everything from 5G technology to, uh, to vaccines. All right, our thanks to Bloomberg's Bill Ferries. Thanks for jumping on and breaking mm -hmm. down that story for us. And still ahead of President Trump's visit to Kenosha, Wisconsin today, he said that Democratic nominee, former Vice President Joe Biden, sparred over blame for street violence linked to racial injustice and police treatment of minorities that erupted in recent days. We have to stop this horrible left-wing ideology that seems to be permeating our country. And basically, it's weakness. It's weakness on behalf of Democrat politicians or Republicans. Do I look like a radical socialist with a soft spot for rioters? Really? I want a safe America, safe from COVID, safe from crime and looting, safe from racially motivated violence, safe from bad cops. Let me be crystal clear, safe from four more years of Donald Trump. For more now, we welcome Jim Moore. He is an associate professor and director of political outreach at the Tom McCall Center for Civic Engagement at Pacific University in Portland, Oregon. Professor, thank you for joining us. Uh, Kenosha has really upended the 2020 election cycle. The Democrats are saying that this is an issue of racial inequality and that the uh, occupant of the White House, President Trump, has done little to alleviate racial tensions in the country. Meanwhile, Republicans and President Trump are suggesting that it's Democratic uh, political machines in cities that have led uh, to, to this divide. How will swing voters interpret the events happening in Kenosha? Well, at this point, swing voters look like they're not worrying about it that much. Remember, there's a lot of polling, especially in the crucial battleground states, the Michigans, Wisconsin's, Pennsylvania's, showing only 3 to 5 percent of the people are undecided at this point, so potential swing voters. Uh, and when you look nationally, it's not much more than that. Uh, so when we look at those swing voters, it appears that they're worried about COVID-19 and they're worried about the economy. Uh, the latest polls I saw from last week, just as the Republicans were getting going, showed that only about 5% of the people said crime was one of their top issues. And it was about number five or number six on their list. So right now, it doesn't look like this is going to swing voters, and there aren't that many swing voters out there 
for the president to try to sway. You know, Professor, you said that voters right now are really concerned about the economy. You look at places like Portland, for example, you have unemployment that's higher than the national average. How much of that, too, can play into this, where it actually might favor Trump, as some J.P. Morgan strategists have mentioned, where all of this unrest plays right into his playbook? Well, I think it does play into his playbook, and he's been very upfront about it since basically the beginning of June that he wants it to play into his playbook. Uh, he wants this to be a law and order presidency. He's been very explicit, as in his advisors have been explicit. He wants to mimic the 1968 election where Richard Nixon used law and order to win a close election and become president of the United States. Uh, the issue that he faces, though, is the overwhelming health concerns of COVID and the overwhelming economic concerns. Even if you have a job, you're worried you're going to continue to have a job or your salary has been cut. That kind of worry right now outweighs law and order things. But the longer that the protests go on, and not the protests themselves, but the, the violent things we see. In Portland, for instance, there's a few hundred people out on the streets every night these days. We had 10,000 in June. Now it's a few hundred. And of those, a couple of dozens are the ones who light fires and things like that every night. And so it is it, when we focus on that, and the president wants us to focus on that, then there's a fear that develops. And the, the president is hoping for that fear. And he's been very, very upfront about wanting that to happen. You know, it's really remarkable because essentially what the Republicans are saying is will the Democrats care about the small business who gets uh, by a handful of those of those rioters? Will they care about the small business who, who's looted or who's burned to the ground? And what the Democrats are saying, Professor Jim Moore, is that essentially, well, has has the president done anything to alleviate this? But I want to pull back up uh, the uh, the Wisconsin election results in, in Kenosha County because this is absolutely fascinating in terms of the swing voters that are really going to side this. There it is. If for our, our very, uh, for our radio audience. Audiences. I mean, for the first time in more than four cycles, at least, the, the Republican candidate, candidate Donald Trump, beat the Democrats in 2016 in Kenosha County. You look back at previous presidential histories, 2012, 2008, 04, 2000, Democrats far, far beat in Kenosha County uh, uh, the, the Republican candidates. So what is it specifically about uh, President Trump that he played well, Jim, in Kenosha County in 2016? President Trump ran as the outsider. He ran, and we've seen this before, this is Ronald Reagan in a big way, but it's Jimmy Carter. Bill Clinton ran as an outsider. He ran as the outsider, and Hillary Clinton was the consummate insider. What had government done for people in Kenosha County? Man, jobs had been leaving. The quality of life was disintegrating. There were previous things with the police there. So they looked around and said, you know, this is not what we want. We want the change agent. Now, the issue that President Trump faces right now is he's been in power for four years. He's been the president. Have things changed? So it would be interesting if one of the candidates, probably Biden, eventually asked the Ronald Reagan question that he asked of Jimmy Carter. Are you better off now than you were four years ago? That would be something that would make a difference there. Another issue in all of Wisconsin, but especially Kenosha County, when you get up and look at some of the big cities, uh, there were fewer voters mm -hmm. there in 2016 than there had been in previous elections, simply because of the ways that they ran the polling places and who was eligible to vote and things like that. Mm. And part of that was minority communities stayed home. I don't think minority communities are going to stay home in this election coming up. Yeah, voter turnout ever more important. Thank you, as always, Jim Moore with Pacific University. And stay with us. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. From Washington, D.C., I'm Kevin Cirilli. And from New York, I'm Taylor Riggs. We want to turn now to Mark Crumpton for the Bloomberg First Word News. Mark. Taylor and Kevin, thank you so much. Senate Republicans are pulling together a $500 billion COVID-19 relief package aiming for a vote next week in an effort to prod Democrats back to the negotiating table. Republican lawmakers in the Senate have been working on a slimmed down virus stimulus that would spend much less money than the $1 trillion proposal put forward by Senate Republicans last month. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin is set to testify today before the House subcommittee investigating the federal response 
to the coronavirus pandemic. Jared Kushner and other U.S. officials visited a major air base in the United Arab Emirates today. The U.S. delegation arrived in the UAE on an El Al plane on Monday in the first ever direct commercial passenger flight between Israel and the UAE. Last month, the two countries agreed to establish diplomatic relations. The visit came as Iran's supreme leader called the UAE's recognition of Israel treason. Representatives of Iran and the world powers working to save the landmark 2015 nuclear deal with Tehran met today in Vienna. It was their first meeting since the United States announced a bid to restore United Nations sanctions against Iran. The deal promised Iran economic incentives in exchange for curbs on its nuclear program. But with the reinstatement of sanctions, the other nations have been struggling to provide Iran with the help it wants. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. Kevin and Taylor. Thank you, Mark. Now, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics is projecting employment to grow four tenths of a percent every year for over the next decade. It's a forecast much slower than the 1.3 percent expansion rate we saw following 2008. Against that economic backdrop, many investors are betting on easy money for the foreseeable future. Former Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen agrees, saying low rates are here to stay. One way or another, my guess is that we're in for a very long period of exceptionally low rates and asset purchases. Over the last decade, inflation has shown very little responsiveness to changes in labor market slack or economic activity. And that suggests that unemployment may need to fall to very low levels during the next expansion and stay at very low levels for quite a long time. For more insight, I want to bring in Blairina Urici, the senior U.S. economist at Barclays. And I understand that the Fed wants to keep rates at zero for the foreseeable future. How much more, though, can they do without the help of fiscal stimulus? Thank you, Taylor. Uh, thanks for having me. And that's a great question. I think uh, what the Fed is trying to do is to really focus on those parts uh, of the economy and uh, that it can influence and to really focus on its mandate, which is labor markets and inflation. And so last week we heard a lot from Jay Powell in terms of what they plan to do to bring inflation uh, higher. We all know over the past decade they've been undershooting their target and this move towards an inflation, uh, a flexible inflation averaging framework is them telling us that they're going to stay put for a very long time until they see inflation uh, sustainably above target for a number of years. I think this is important. It has practical implications for monetary policy. We don't expect interest rates to be lifted for a number of years now. I think it will also have implications for labor markets. That's something that the Fed believes they can help over the medium run. What they can do there is not a tighten policy at the first sign that the unemployment rate is declining because they know that the pursuit of an ever lower unemployment rate is not going to endanger their inflation target in a meaningful way. So in a way, it feels as if the Fed, as far as overheating labor markets is concerned, yeah. it feels that it can right. have its cake and eat it. Well, Lorena, you know, I think you make such a great point, and that's exactly where I want to take the conversation, because how much pressure can the central bank put on Washington, D.C., Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, Leader McConnell, Speaker Pelosi, to finally push fiscal stimulus over the finish line? I mean, it's not just the central bank, but a lot of folks are banking that that fiscal stimulus is ultimately going to be injected into this economy. So... Two very important separate issues here in my view. First of all, the importance of fiscal policy. A phase four is crucial to make this a recovery sustainable. It's crucial because the unemployment rate is still at double digits. And from here, we can't withdraw the support to small businesses and to consumers that we've had so far. What can the Fed do about it? I think we got a, a taste of that from uh, Vice Chair Clarida's remarks yesterday, he was very clear to say, look, we use fiscal policy as an input. 
Uh, we have no influence over it. So what we're going to do, we're going to watch how uh, fiscal authorities are going to react and we're going to uh, incorporate that in our reaction function. How successful are you thinking was PPP? I keep hearing from small and medium sized businesses. They don't need more debt. They don't need more loans. They need grants. They need revenue. They need relief. How are you thinking about the success of PPP? Well, I think the PPP was very important, especially at the initial stages of the recovery. It has provided about half a trillion dollars in terms of uh, uh, loans to small businesses. And supporting small businesses is very important in my view. I think they are the backbone of the economy. They provide close to 40% of employment in the US. They also don't have uh, access to a financial market liquidity like larger companies do. And I think an important aspect of the PPP was that if you use most of that loan to pay uh, the payroll bills, then that can be forgivable uh, down the line. So in effect, it can be a form of a grant, but of course, um, the lack of information and the way it was deployed at the beginning, and I think also the uncertainty about the terms of the loans and the length of the loan, I think that compounded to make businesses right. uh, quite skeptical of this loan. You know, it's going to be remarkable to see just where they go from there. And of course, Mark Meadows, the president's chief of staff, saying earlier today uh, that he's not willing yet to have Republicans place a price tag on there. Thank you to Lorena Yorucci of Barclays, U.S. Barclays. She is, the, of course, the senior U.S. economist. And we're going to hear more about how the U.S. economy is faring amid the pandemic from Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin. He's going to be testifying before the House Select Subcommittee on the coronavirus crisis. That's at 1 p.m. Eastern, and we will bring it to you live. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Huge, interesting vaccine headlines coming out in the last 30 minutes. Let me bring you some of those. U.S. advisors are offering a draft on how to distribute a vaccine. There's going to be a four-phased plan for vaccine distribution. Phase one is frontline health workers, nursing homes. Phase two looks like older adults outside nursing homes, as well as teachers and students. Phase three, broader immunization, followed by most everyone else in phase four. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio from New York. I'm Taylor Riggs. And from Washington, D.C., I'm Kevin Cirilli. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. Kevin Taylor, thank you. President Trump resumes his effort to make unrest in U.S. cities a central issue in his campaign. He's en route to Kenosha, Wisconsin. The city's been plagued by violence since the shooting of a black man by police last month. Wisconsin's Democratic governor asked the president not to come, saying the visit might inflame tensions in Kenosha. China likely plans to double its stockpile of nuclear warheads in this decade, including those designed to be carried atop ballistic missiles that can reach the United States. That's according to a new report from the Pentagon, which says China has been rapidly building up its military. China's growing arsenal of nuclear weapons will provide an added rationale for U.S. officials who want to accelerate the modernization of America's nuclear forces. Russia has become the fourth country in the world to confirm more than a million cases of COVID-19. A strict nationwide lockdown in the spring helped tame an initial surge of coronavirus in Russia, but new cases have remained stubbornly high. Russia averaged more than 5,000 new cases a day in August. The United States, India and Brazil are the only other nations to top one million cases. Public tours of the White House, halted nearly six months ago due to the coronavirus outbreak, are set to resume later this month. The White House says there will be new health and safety policies in place. Tours will be held two days a week instead of five, and the number of visitors will be capped. All guests over the age of two will be required to wear a face covering and practice social distancing. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. 
I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Taylor, Kevin. Thank you, Mark. And let's go back to that news out of the Pentagon that Mark just mentioned, warning that about uh, warning about the country's rapid military buildup in China, capable of deploying nuclear weapons on land, in the air, and at sea, a capacity known as the nuclear triad. Let's bring in Ian Bremmer, Eurasia Group president and G Zero Media president. What emphasis and pressure, Ian, is this going to place on the Pentagon to try to boost up their protectionism, but also to modernize their nuclear response capabilities? Hopefully not too much. Uh, China has always heretofore considered that a nuclear arms race was not in their interest and they didn't even want to play. Uh, they have about 300 nuclear uh, warheads right now compared to about 6,000 in the United States. It's unfortunate that the Chinese government is now, as part of growing nationalism, uh, signaling to their own people, more than to the United States, uh, that they are uh, preparing to modernize and expand that capacity. But it's very far uh, from, say, where the Americans are, where the Russians are. It says a lot more about the fact that Xi Jinping has had a horrible year, the Chinese president, and that he is engaging in greater nationalism everywhere. Uh, whether it's the the fight that we're seeing that's flared up yet again in the Himalayas with the Indians, whether it is the very assertive unilateral um, national security law they've put in place um, in Hong Kong, whether it's the arrest of Canadian, of Australian, of other nationals um, in China right now. I mean, all of these things are showing more about the potential insecurity of Xi Jinping than they are about a near-term uh, threat to the United States. I want to take the conversation right there on what you described, Ian Bremmer, as the horrible year for Xi Jinping and the insecurity of Xi Jinping. Because all of the developments you listed, you look at the GDP and how China as a country has outperformed the rest of the world. And yet here we are talking about the headlines with regards to vaccinations that are very close to being in the market. Once the vaccinations are in the market, do you anticipate global economic pressure from Europe, from Australia, from the U.S. that will be placed specifically on Xi Jinping? I think it's happening right now. I mean, we still have this zombie phase one agreement um, where the Chinese are buying some more from the U.S. and they've provided some more market access. But the more important economic pressure is coming from the U.S. and others on important state enterprises, the most important uh, economic institution that China has in Xinjiang, for example, connected to the Uyghurs, massive construction firms. Of course, the tech um, Cold War that we see, Huawei is firmly being targeted by the U.S. and many allies. That's the most important national champion China has in new technology. All of this is hurting the Chinese economy, and it's hurting it under Xi Jinping's uh, watch. Uh, you're right that the Chinese economy has rebounded faster than anything else because of their ability to engage in surveillance and quarantine more effectively than other countries. Um, but still, we're talking about no growth for China this year. That was inconceivable to the Chinese leadership before the pandemic hit. So even there, you can play the relative game and say that China got their supply chain back up and running, and we're all thankful for that. But this is on, on any front you look at, this is worse than anything the Chinese leadership could have been prepared for expecting uh, at, at the beginning of the year. Ian, you rightfully, I think, bring up the tech Cold War, 5G race, Huawei pressures. I want to play a thought here, a soundbite that we have for you about the president regarding TikTok. Take a listen. Well, I told them that uh, they have till September 15th to make a deal. After that, we close it up in this country. And uh, I said that the United States has to be compensated, well compensated, because we are the ones that are making it possible. And so we should be compensated. So the Treasury has to be well compensated. Ian, TikTok is just an example of CFIUS review of uncertainty about China's data, about their private policies, their data policies, their data gathering policies all in China. How are you thinking about TikTok and technology broader as the new frontier for a Cold War? Well, first, since you played that one quote, you do know that Larry Kudlow and others 
have publicly admitted they had no idea what Trump was talking about in terms of U.S. Treasury being compensated. There's no legal process for that to occur. He was just kind of spitballing, as he frequently does. But I do think <laughs> that the willingness to go after uh, TikTok, WeChat, um, you know, force uh, these companies to sell or they'll be shut down, I think that's real. Um, and you saw Kevin Meyer's uh, re resignation um, as CEO um, of TikTok as a consequence of that. I mean, he was not up for uh, running what was going to have to be an impossible position being torn between the Americans and the Chinese. The Chinese are actually saying that, no, it's not September 15th. We're going to have 30 days where we have to decide whether or not we would allow some of these sensitive Chinese technologies to be exported, the kind of thing the Americans uh, and, and Europeans have talked about historically. If they stick to that position, then there's going to be at least some number of weeks or longer where American teens are going to have to find a different app to dance on, right? I mean, this is... The, the Chinese can deal with that. I mean, this is not a strategic importance to China. But what it is saying is that apps and app developers who we thought of as these global citizens, they're putting together these programs that everyone's supposed to use. Yep. Instead, we're dividing humanity into people that are linked to Chinese apps and people that are linked to other mm -hmm. American, Western, Japanese, other apps. Um, and, uh, and not only is that bad for economic efficiency, uh, but of course, it's probably bad for humanity because if we're not all talking to each other, we're much more likely to dehumanize each other. Ian, I want to switch gears with you and go to other international relations. The Iran deal was back in focus. Say you have the committee overseeing that meeting back in Vienna to discuss the state of that. I'm thinking in hindsight, was that deal a good deal? And without U.S. participation, where does Iran stand? Well, I mean, it, the thing was, I supported the deal, but I never thought it was nearly as big of a deal as it was promoted as being by Obama, by former Secretary John Kerry. It didn't end all the sanctions. It didn't lead to diplomatic normalization between the U.S. and Iran. It didn't stop the Iranians from uh, putting lots of money into Hezbollah and other radical organizations in the region. It didn't stop them from ballistic missile testing and research that was in breach of other U.N. Security Council resolutions. It gave them some money. It gave it unfroze some of their assets. It let some investments occur, and it froze their nuclear program. That's a pretty limited deal. So for as much as it accomplished, I thought it was a small step forward. But now that that deal, that the Americans have stepped away, and, and this Vienna meeting makes it very clear, we have triggered the snapback procedure at the UN, and by 19 September, the deal will technically be scrubbed from the books of international law, and UN sanctions will return. They will snap back. At least that's what the Trump administration wants. The other permanent members of the Security Council all reject that, but the Americans are a lot more powerful. And so even though you see the Iranians right now trying to reduce their friction with the international community to maximize American isolation, they even last week uh, agreed uh, with the International uh, Atomic Energy Agency to resolve an outstanding inspections issue. So it's removing crisis points. Like the Iranians are saying, right. we want to play ball, we want to play ball. But the Americans are the biggest, most powerful country out there. And if we're the ones mm -hmm. pushing for the snapback, that's really going to hurt the Iranians and the Iranian economy. Well, you know what else is going to hurt the Iranians is this new uh, normalization of ties, potentially, between uh, Israel and the UAE. Jared Kushner and company and Brian Hook and 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 the likes, and uh, uh, National Security Advisor O'Brien, they're in the Gulf Arab states. They're, they're, they're touring there this week, and they're trying to, to maybe pick up another, another state to join, to join UAE. Is it going to be Morocco? Is it going to be Sudan? Is it going to be Bahrain? What do you think? Well, uh, we haven't heard. I mean, Pompeo uh, was in Bahrain, was hoping, and Sudan was hoping he was going to get movement quickly. They haven't made any announcements yet. Um, there are lots of levers the Americans can pull, uh, military support, certainly um, removing Sudan uh, from sanctions lists. That would be helpful. They want that. I think we will see additional countries that agree to normalize relations with Israel uh, before Trump's term in office is up. I, I think the movement is in that direction, and you're right. In large part, it is because common antipathy to Iran, 
is trumping any residual support these countries have for the Palestinians, who are increasingly kind of a lost cause and really thrown under the bus, right? And no one's talking about them anymore. And that's, that's quite sad. But this is uh, a new geopolitics in the region. By the way, that, that historic flight you just saw taken, the first between Israel and the UAE, they flew over Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. I, I think that's actually a big deal. Mohammed bin Salman would like to normalize relations. He's not king. Mm -hmm. A lot of conservatives among the religious elites in his country really oppose it. But they're also moving in that direction. And they're the ones that would allow Bahrain uh, to make that decision. So if I were making a bet, I might bet on uh, Manama and, uh, and Bahrain first. Ian, in, in just the last minute that we have with you, how does a potential Biden election change relations in the Middle East, thinking more specifically the U.S. rejoining the JCPOA? They want to. Uh, I think that would be the biggest place that you would see a change. Certainly, Biden would immediately start working with the American allies in the JCPOA, the Iranian nuclear deal, to get back to where we were. I do not think the Iranian supreme leader would suddenly approve it, certainly not with near-term Iranian presidential elections coming up, because that would support moderates that he has no intention of bailing out. Uh, remember, this deal was originally on their backs more than on the supreme leader. But it would take pressure off. There's no question. And over time, I think you'd move to a more cooperative stance. Huge conversation. Wish you could have. Wish we could have you on for a, maybe another hour. Thank you as always, Ian Bremer, Eurasia Group President and G Zero Media President. Much more next. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. From Washington, D.C., I'm Kevin Cirilli. And from New York, I'm Taylor Riggs. I want to get some of the key U.S. economic data out today. Uh, joining us now, Michael McKee, our Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent. And Mike, we know on the opening bell around 945, you were so helpful with the market PMI data. And then at the top of the 10, we had those crucial ISM manufacturing data looking a little bit better than expected. Yeah, both come in uh, at a reasonable level and certainly for the ISM data, a better than expected level. They get up to 56 on that index, which is the best change uh, that we've had since 2018. So there is strength in manufacturing. And when you look under the hood, uh, not only are new orders up significantly to 67.6, but customer inventories, what companies think their customers need, way, way down, customer inventory is very low. So it looks like they're anticipating a lot more work ahead in the nation's factories. The problem that we have is that they're not hiring people to do it. We still have a, an employment index in the 40s, which is below the level of expansion. So it's hard to see that it necessarily makes a big dent in the number of people who are unemployed. Michael, when you when you look at all of those indicators, however, how important is it or how how much are business leaders banking that more stimulus is going to make their way into the market so that they can uh, free up some of the some of the things that have held them back? Well, there seems to be a lot of anticipation that there will be something because so many people are still out of work. And because those unemployment additional ben payments have stopped, so that means there's less spending out there, and so people are less likely to help boost these companies' earnings. But uh, if it doesn't happen, then the companies are going to have to find another way to deal with it. And what we s are seeing so far, Kevin, is a number of layoffs announced, especially by the airlines and some of the bigger uh, manufacturing companies in, say, the aerospace industry. That could spread throughout the economy if we don't see any kind of additional help coming soon. And Mike, those layoffs, the success of the CARES Act, of course, going to be in focus when we hear from Treasury Secretary Mr. Mnuchin at the top of the next hour. Push us forward into some of the comments that you would like to hear from the Treasury Secretary. Well, I think the comment everybody would like to hear is that I'm sitting down with Nancy Pelosi and we're going to negotiate something. <laughs> but from everything that we've heard, that's not going to be what he's going to say. Obviously, it's a political time and we're going to hear people criticize the 
administration of the CARES Act. You know, too many loans went to too big a companies, that sort of thing. And there will probably be criticism of the two sides politically for not getting together. But really, uh, what's happened so far has been pretty good by Washington standards, fairly effective. It's the fact that it's gone away now and there's no replacement in sight that has everybody worried. All right, our thanks to Bloomberg's Michael McKee. And up next, we're taking a look at what may be the marquee Democratic Senate primary of the year in Massachusetts, a Kennedy versus an incumbent. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Today is election day in Massachusetts, but the Democrats are not taking on the Republicans. The Democratic Party is taking on itself. It's Congressman Joe Kennedy III versus Senator Ed Markey, the incumbent progressive. And Bloomberg contributor Jeannie Zeno joins us now. All right, you've got a Kennedy, a young, rising Democratic rock star, challenging a progressive in Senator Ed Markey. This is a political junkie's dream matchup. What do we know, Jeannie? It is, and it is just in keeping with the craziness of this year that you have a Kennedy potentially, and we won't know until later today, maybe, if we get the results, losing in a primary in Massachusetts. And, of course, as you mentioned, this is a young rising star in the party who may potentially go down in defeat to a 74-year-old Ed Markey. Um, and so, you know, I think it's something that when this first race first came out, people said, oh, Joe Kennedy is going to he's going to take it in a slam dunk. And now many of these polls have Ed Markey ahead by double digits in some cases. And what has happened, of course, is that he has garnered the support of the progressive, energized left and young people and representatives like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to sort of be the new Bernie Sanders of Massachusetts. You know, it's it's remarkable. I mean, his his great uncles are Ted Kennedy and, of course, former President Kennedy. Uh, but he, he is he's uh, potentially has other political ambitions. Where could he run should he not get the outcome he wants tonight? Well, it, it, you know, he's going to have to do some real soul searching if he doesn't win this thing tonight. And it looks like he might not. There obviously will still be a place for him in Massachusetts Democratic politics, we think. But it, what seems to be happening is this party, especially in states like Massachusetts, the energy, especially in primaries, is all on the left, and he no longer fits that. You know, he is more of a moderate guy, and he is not able to energize this base that he needs to get out. So where could he go from here? He, you know, he could have a state run. He could certainly do something along those lines. But I do think he's going to have to think about how he fits into the Democratic Party in Massachusetts going forward. Jeannie, how is this not only figuring out how to fit into the Democratic Party in Massachusetts, but how to fit into a more general election? When you think about what's going on in Massachusetts, you take that to a broader scale and you really do see that the far left versus the moderates trying to appeal to both parties here within the Democratic Party. How do you see this really is more indicative to what's going on on the national stage? It's such a good question because, of course, what Joe Biden is dealing with at this point and has been throughout this process is that he is trying to hold this coalition together. You, you know, that may be one reason people speculate that the Democrats didn't say as much about what's going on in Portland during their week-long convention, and then the Republicans hit them on that. So, you know, the Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, they are in a very similar position. For us here in New York, we know Governor Cuomo has been in this position, trying to keep these really, really energized, progressive voters and activists in the coalition and happy and supporting them. And it's not an easy task. It's not easy to do. We see the same thing in the Republican Party. And so I do think it's very indicative of what's going on. I'm anxious to see, and I haven't looked in the last few hours, if we get anything from Donald Trump out of this, because, of course, this fits very much in line with what he wants to say, which is that this party is moving to the left. Don't vote for Joe Biden because he is just a Trojan horse of the progressive left. And you look at what happened in Massachusetts, he'll say, and this is, you know, case in point.
I'm not ready to count out Joe Kennedy yet, just because you know you got to with a name like that, you got to you know they know how to turn out the vote. But I hear exactly your point in terms of he's an underdog in this race. Very quickly in the 45 seconds or so that we have less left, I'm fascinated by the by the Senate race in South Carolina. What do we know about the incumbent there? Uh, looking ahead to November 3rd with Lindsey Graham. Oh, yeah, that's going to be uh, absolutely fascinating. Lindsey Graham, you know, there are times in which, you know, we have said Lindsey Graham is a shoe in This may not be one of them. This is going to be a race to watch. And I think as Republicans are nervous about holding the Senate, it's races like this which make them really nervous, and rightly so. And, you know, just back to Massachusetts for one second, to your point, if Kennedy does pull this off, there's another story there, which is what is going yep. on with these polls. And so that's something else we got to watch out for. Yeah, huge thank you there, Brilliant. Bloomberg contributor and professor at Iona College. That is Jeannie Zeno. And Kevin, I know that you're going to be continuing this conversation. So interesting as well, because coming up, Balance of Power, it's going to be continuing on Bloomberg Radio. We're going to be bringing you Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin's testimony before the House Select Subcommittee on the coronavirus. A lot to be listening for. We're awaiting huge comments come out of the CARES Act, the handling of PPP, any uh, future, of course, stimulus that we may expect as well. So really interested, Kevin, to hear all of those comments coming from the Treasury Secretary. Kevin, this was fun. From Always This fun is Balance Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio, and this is Bloomberg.